Alibaba has just introduced Animate Anyone 2, and it's promising high fidelity character image animation with environmental affordance. This work follows the previous work, which is Animate Anyone, and Animate Anyone came around June last year. And if we look at the results of that, we can see that it has kind of plain background and it's not realistic images that are being animated. It's a pretty controlled environment with the background being plain and there's nothing very dynamic happening in the environment. But if we look at the results of Animate Anyone 2, it's really taking us to the next level. For example, we can see this character is being replaced by this character from the static image and we can see how realistic the animations are. For example, look at the legs look at how well the character blends with the background and even in these gaps we can see how well the background is being filled so that's really stunning and we really have to nitpick if we actually want to find any errors with this animation there are some subtle problems like for example between the leg and the body we can see that the background is a bit blurry compared to the actual background but we're really just nitpicking you know we can see how far the animation has come and this can have wonderful applications. So in this video, let's look into what are the novelties in Animate Anyone 2 that has led to this level of realistic output. So if we look at the paper, they're saying in the introduction that the, that the critical limitation of the current methods is that the spatial relationship between the character and the environment often lacks authenticity and the intricate human object interaction are disrupted. Basically the interaction between the character and the environment is, it's quite obvious from the animation that we have done something about it and it doesn't look pretty natural. So if we take the previous work, for example, movie character or anchor crafter or even Mimo, all these methods have this problem with the spatial relationship of the character with that of the environment. Here they are saying that they are introducing environmental affordance in order to fix this problem. So let's later on look into what this environmental affordance is and how they are fixing this problem. If we look at their contribution, they're saying that they have introduced a novel framework, which is Animate Anyone 2, which is capable of animating characters with environment affordance, achieving robust performance. And they are also proposing an environmental formulation and they have also introduced object injection strategy. Along with that, they have finally introduced post-modulation strategy. So these are the main contributions of the paper. Let's now deep dive into each of these and find out how they actually address the spatial relationship problem between the character and the environment. So if we look at the method, they're saying that they are introducing the Animate Anyone 2 framework. In subsection 3.1, they are introducing the overall framework of Animate Anyone 2 and then they are moving to the environment formulation and then the object injection and finally the post modulation strategy let's look into each of them one after the other let's look at the overall framework now so in terms of the framework what they're doing is given a video sequence with several images they are decomposing it into four so the first one is that of the environment. They call it IE. And what they do is they remove the main character and they just keep the environment. And this is the first sequence. And in the next one, what they do is they just keep the character. They call it IC, where you remove the entire background and just keep the character. And with this one, they are adding a random background in order to make it look like a real image and the third one they're doing is they're keeping the object and removing the rest they're calling it the io o for the object and the fourth one is that of the im where you know you keep just the motion sequence this motion sequence is just an example and it does not correspond to this particular character we get the idea basically we just keep the motion and remove the rest with these four sequences what they're doing it is they're just combining them together and passing it through the network that they have defined and they are training this network and at the output they're showing this same input video that they've got and they are training the network to reproduce the same video that is here so this is a self-supervised network where you don't have any supervisory signal and it's pretty much the input that's taking care of training the network. And during inference, what happens is interesting. So you give the input video sequence 
you just give a reference character as input and you pass it for inference and at the output you will see that this character is animated corresponding to the video sequence so that's the overview of the framework let's deep dive into the different contributions of the paper so in terms of the neural network that they are using for the training they are using a diffusion model which is pretty much a standard for generating images or videos but more specifically they're using latent diffusion model which is more compute efficient and they're saying that they have changed the original 2d unit architecture to a 3d unit architecture in order to incorporate the temporal layers because now we're dealing with videos we need to take care of the temporal layers and that is the main change in terms of the network architecture and then we have this conditional uh, signals which come from the motion and the environment and also the object we can see that we have these three conditioning signals which are the character the object and the motion on top of the uh, the environment so let's see how they deal with that so they seem to adapt the reference net architecture and similar to them what they're doing is first with the environment sequence they are using a variational autoencoder encoder to encode the embeddings and subsequently just merge it with the noise latents and with in terms of the motion they're proposing something called the post modulation strategy we'll look into it when we look into section 3.4 and for the object sequence they are using something called the object guider which we'll look into when we look into the section 3.3 so right now let's look into environmental formulation now one of the simplest ways to extract the environment out of this input sequence is the you know to just use some segmentation model to to segment out this person and then just straight away use whatever comes in the background as the environment formulation but the problem is we are interested more in motion animation so what if the character that we want to put in this place if we want to replace this one with this new character and if this new character is quite big then it won't merge very well with this environment. We will see some artifacts at these boundaries where the new character comes in and the environment. So in order to address this problem, they are proposing a new environment formulation. So what is this environment formulation? If we look at the masks, instead of just simply just segmenting out the person with a, with a fine grain boundary, they are trying to just differentiate the object by using these very pixelated kind of uh, boundary or they're saying that you know we can go much more pixelated and just use this shape to represent this mask rather than using a very fine grain mask so this way the model will understand that whenever this shapes appear this shape or this shape appear the model will know that that is where the object comes and will just blend the new object seamlessly instead of just having a fine grain boundary and that's what they're calling as the mask formulation though the masking strategy provides advantage one of the drawbacks could be that since the formulation is inherently larger than the original mask so the mask will turn out to be larger than the original mask and in order to overcome this bias what they're doing is that they're employing some random scale augmentation on the source video so basically you have mask on different scales and you use these scaled mask rather than just a fixed size mask and this will reduce the bias in the system once the environment formulation is sorted next comes object injection for this one they are employing segment anything model version 2 which is sam2 and they are literally just segmenting out the object and they are passing this segmented image through a variational autoencoder encoder to get the encodings of the object which is the object latents let's have a look so you have the source image or the video and you extract the object using segment anything model and then you pass it through an encoder and they are introducing what is called the object guider so naively you could just directly concatenate this one into the network but they are introducing this object guider in order to enhance this representations so what is this object guider so the object guider is nothing but a 3 by 3 conf 2d layer and it's used for downsampling the input four times they do multi-scale features using this convolution layer and they are then directly concatenating the output of this guider to the network rather than directly concatenating it it's as simple as that 
So that's what the object guider is doing here. It's generating the features at different scales shown by this green lines in different sizes. And they are concatenated into the denoising network in the decoder layers. So one more small detail that we need to note is that how these object latents are blended with the noise latents. So instead of just directly concatenating them, they are using something called the alpha blending factor, which is nothing but a weightage between the noise latents and object latents. So you combine them by giving a weightage and then you have more control over which dominates over the other. So that's what they have represented using an equation. If you look at this one, they're saying that they're concatenating the noise and the object latents and they're using alpha which is just a weighing factor let's say alpha is 0 0.8 then it's 0 0.8 of the object latent and 0 0.2 of the noise latent so the next novelty of the paper is that of post modulation so if you take the previous work which is animate anyone the first version they use just the skeletal relationship in order to capture the post modulation or in order to cap capture the uh, character motion but the problem with the skeletal representation is that it lacks explicit modeling of interlimb spatial relationship which means that you know if you have different parts of the limb for example, let's have a look at it. So we have different parts of the limb. You don't know how this limb interacts with this limb. For example, this limb can only move backwards corresponding to this one because it's a leg. This kind of relationship between the different parts of the limb is not represented by this pose. But rather, what these guys are suggesting is that we can use the depth information on top of the pose information. So they use a different network in order to extract depth. They're then using the pose as a mask and then they're just using the information where actually the post is there and they're ignoring rest of the parts and finally they are putting the board through a 2d convolution network and using a cross attention mechanism they are just merging them too the merged output is passed through a 3d convolution the output of which is known as the post modulated output this network seems to be very similar to that of the object guider so that's what they're saying here they first binarize the skeletal image to obtain the skeletal mask and then extract the depth results within these mask regions and they ignore rest of the regions and they use 2d convolution of course after that and the arch architectural design very much resembles that of the post guider in order to match the dimensions of the post guider and they merge the structure depth information in the skeletal features through the cross attention mechanism and they use 3d convolution to model temporal motion information similar to the other network because we now have the temporal information we need, we need to use 3d convolution rather than a 2d convolution so with those novelties the approach seems to work pretty well and they have moved on to experiments let's see what they go how they go about implementing it so they're saying that the experiments were done on eight nvidia a100 gpus it could probably be just one machine with eight nvidia a100 gpus and they trained for 100,000 steps with a batch size of eight and video length batch is 16 and the reference image is randomly sampled from the video sequence and they're using center cropping so with that approach to training these are some of the qualitative results that they have obtained so if we take this as the character that needs to be animated then we can see that it's animated like this pretty nicely and this is also another example in the video that we saw if we take this character and it's getting animated like this quite nicely i really like where the kind of we could see where the the feet of the character meets the ground like it's it's very realistic actually and then moving on to some qualitative results they have compared it on tiktok benchmark and they compared it with the other methods and it's the same story that their approach is better than the other methods that they have compared with and they've also evaluated on the proposed data set they're saying that because there's limitation on the existing benchmark that exhibit domain proximity and the existing data sets cannot effectively evaluate the generalizability of the models across diverse scenarios so they've established a test set comprising 100 characters videos for evaluating real world scenarios to conduct additional evaluation 
and they're saying that the, the qualitative comparison is shown in table two. So that's table two and they can see that their method does pretty well compared to all of the other ones, even in comparison to Animate Anyone, which is the first version of their work. And then they wrap up with some ablation studies. For example, they, they ablate on the environment formulation and they show the qualitative results in figure seven, which says the ablation study of environmental formulation. So what happens if they use a precise mask? and versus what happens if they do bounding box and versus the actual the masking technique that they have used so if you use a bounding box you can see the hands are not looking great and if you use a precise mask the hands are not looking great either but with this approach the hands look much more realistic and so this masking strategy is far better than the one that they proposed in animate anyone or for that matter any state of the art similarly they ablate for object modeling and they have shown in table four the result of object modeling and they're saying that you know without spatial blending and without post modulation and finally including all of that we can see that includes including spatial blending and post modulation the approach leads to better performance indicating the significance of both of them and so for the post modulation again they're saying that it's in table four yeah it's in table four like you said it seems to improve the performance they pretty much go more ahead to discussion and conclusion so it's pretty much a simple paper i would say the approach is quite straightforward slight improvements in engineering and it seems to work beautifully well in order to take care of character animation in challenging environments so i'm quite like this paper so i hope to see you in a similar paper in the upcoming videos until then i'm signing off and i will see you in my next take care